janefinch.com. All right, um, it's Butterfly for janefinch.com with liberal incumbent Judy Scro. How are you today? Just terrific. Awesome. So would you tell our viewers a little bit about your political uh, career? Well, but I'm really pleased to be here talking to you this morning, having an opportunity to again communicate with my uh, constituents. Uh, I have been uh, in political life for 22 years, um, 12 years as the Member of Parliament for the great community of York West, 11 years before that uh, representing um, an area just to the south of there, south of here, as well as uh, parts of this riding um, on both North York City Council, Metro Council, and the amalgamated city of Toronto. All right. So what's some of the feedback you're getting from the community? What does the com community think about the legacy that, um, that you've uh, laid out? I find it very interesting when I have, when elections are here, that you get a chance to, uh, and I utilize it, to get out and knock on as many doors as possible in mm. the writing. That, to me, is my report card. Mm. Uh, and that's what elections are. Are you doing your job? Are you meeting the needs of the constituents? Uh, do they know who you are when you knock on their door? And I have to say that um, no matter whether I am knocking in some of the single family homes or whether I'm knocking in uh, 15 Tobamori or San Romano Way, uh, it's almost instant recognition. They know who I am, they know what I do, mm -hmm. and they know, most importantly, what I try to do for the community. And that I, my office staff and I are there to try to assist. We can't fix everybody's problem. I wish we had a magic wand and we could. But we're there to listen, we're there to offer assistance, we're there to offer direction, and uh, we're there to hold hands when times are tough, and sometimes that's all part of the job. Okay. Um, so would you share with our viewers some of the current or past initiatives that you're a part of? Certainly issues of transit. Um, when I went to Ottawa, I went there specifically uh, out of my frustration as a city councillor, mm -hmm. uh, trying to balance a budget. Uh, and have to deal with issues of social service pressures, housing issues, transit issues, uh, with n insufficient income mm -hmm. at the city level. Um, I went there to fight for the city of Toronto and my constituents. Um, Mr. Craytian gave me the um, great position of putting a task force together uh, to come back in 18 months with recommendations on, uh, on the city's issue. Now, cities are not uh, creatures of the province. Cities are creatures of the province, mm -hmm. and and have a distant relationship when it comes to the federal government. Uh, and I have to say, as a result of the work that I did, cities are now part of and a partnering uh, issue with the federal government. weren't mm -hmm. there before. Okay. And I've got that. And I think that's a that's a major accomplishment from a federal level to get cities to become a partner mm -hmm. with the federal government rather than just a lower level of government that. Uh, gets listened to every once in a while. The gas tax that uh, our cities all enjoy right now, which is, I don't know, $685 million to Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, as an example, uh, came exactly from the work that I did of getting, getting that voice heard in Ottawa. And it continued, it continued even with the Conservative government. They didn't dare cancel it. Mm. And, uh, and that's good. It's one of the few things we managed to hold on to. Uh, and the establishment of an infrastructure fund that would work in collaboration uh, with the cities so that uh, we have both the, the City of Toronto, the province of Ontario, and the Government of Canada that would sit down at the table to solve the problems. Unfortunately, uh, under the current government, there's much less of that. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't, they're, they're back to, or trying to get back to uh, the idea that cities are creatures of the province and have little to do with the federal government. And uh, I think it's imperative that we get a Liberal government elected so we can go back into working in partnership to building this great country of ours. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's definitely going to be some questions around uh, the tie-ins between the mm -hmm. different uh, parties and how that works. But what's your experience as a woman? Um, again, uh, you've been in so many pa uh, spaces and uh, You've been an advocate in so many ways, mm -hmm. um, but what's that experience like being a woman in a, in a man's world, in politics? Uh, don't kid yourself, it's tough. Um, you know, we're increasing the amount of women in, in, uh, in Parliament, uh, but you're still working in a male-dominated field, uh, whether it is the bureaucracy you're dealing with or the elected officials you're dealing with. Uh, you have to fight to get your voice heard. It doesn't come naturally there. You know, you're sitting around a table predominantly with uh, 
nine out of ten uh, men all the time and you have to fight for finding your place and mm -hmm. that's just the way it is and if you don't fight to get your voice heard and the voices of your community heard they won't be mm -hmm. I mean and that comes uh, you know that comes from many women that I talk to it, it's it, it, you know the glass ceiling is still there and it's, it's going to take my generation your generation and, and my granddaughters to keep pushing because mm -hmm. that's the only way you get hurt. Yeah. Um, so what's your vision for the Jane and Finch York West community or what's your platform? What are you, what are you pushing for in reflection to the community you're representing? Two things come top of mind when you ask me that question. One, the need for more affordable housing. Mm -hmm. It's a huge issue. Absolutely. It's a huge issue here as it is in many communities that are special like ours. Mm -hmm. You know, we get an awful lot of uh, new immigrants who naturally generate to where they have family or friends. You don't want to be isolated. It's, mm -hmm. it's a big enough challenge to move into a new country. Yeah. And you naturally go where you have family and friends. Uh, so we have a lot of overcrowding uh, in the air, but we have a lack of affordable housing for people. Absolutely. I had a gentleman in the, in the office the other day um, I guess he was probably 64 years old, somewhere around. He wasn't quite a senior, and he was struggling. And the, the, his wife had no income. She was sick. Mm -hmm. She needed medication that cost $200 a month. He was living in a basement apartment for $500 a month. And there was almost no money for anything left. Just pure desperation. And um, it's very difficult to be able to, to advise them as to how, how do I find you spot actually was successful in linking him up with some of the great organizations here in the riding uh, and we're working together to see if we can't make uh, make getting him accommodation a priority for him and his wife and get some help for uh, some of the medication so housing's a big issue uh, transportation is another significant issue mm -hmm. again because we have um, a lot of newcomers here a lot of people who are just getting their, themselves entrenched in the Canadian lifestyle, finding decent paying jobs, they rely on transit very heavily. Mm -hmm. And um, you're well aware of the issues with the um, Finch Avenue bus, the overcrowding of that bus. Yep. Uh, I actually, a user. <laughs> yes, I went out and, uh, and tried it out for several days uh, early in the morning. Uh, I actually looked at the 8 o'clock, but I couldn't get on, so it ended, I said, I'll wait till around 9 o'clock so <laughs> I'm not taking somebody who's rushing to work. And so I've been on it several times and clearly, you know, these are communities that because of the makeup of the community need additional help. And that is not just in housing and in community social services, but it's also in issues like transit. Mm -hmm. So you can get back and forth to work or to school. Uh, and, and I really think that too often because, you know, we don't have the resources for, you know, the million dollar homes where they all have cars and three and four cars in their driveways. Mm -hmm areas like ours that need that extra special attention uh, need more transit, not less transit. Absolutely. So speaking about how special our community is, um, there is a huge gap between rich and poor and it's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, there's more austerity measures coming down on us and of course uh, the Jade and Finch uh, community is going to be the first hit already very vulnerable to these attacks on the poor. Um, what would you say to the community in terms of the work that you've been doing and if there is a shift um, and, and the Liberals do secure majority government, what is the direct action in addressing the poverty that's happening in not just Jane and Finch but um, poverty across the country and especially the newcomer and uh, minority communities? Well, the most immediate thing I think I can comment on that is that we would go and uh, put back the $56 million that was cut out of immigrant uh, and settlement agencies, many of them uh, mm -hmm. doing fine work in this uh, community of ours uh, that had significant cuts immediately. The Afghan Association, uh, yeah. Ellsworth Hayworth, the group that deals with women's issues, uh, Rexdale Women's Center, um, countless uh, that have all had significant cuts. Uh, in their services. Part of the success of our country is investing in our new immigrants. That is everything from the English language to job access and so on. The sooner newcomers to Canada can find their way, the faster they will be paying taxes and the faster they will be contributing and that they can have that growth that they came here for, 
from that aspect as far as the immigrant and making sure that we have the social services network that's needed, um, particularly to here. Uh, the second is the investment in housing. Those things are critical and that's part of our platform mm -hmm. would be to um, more assistance to our immigrant and settlement services. Um, in our platform we have a commitment to uh, a national housing strategy working together with the province uh, as we have in the past because any housing that any affordable housing that's getting built in the city is getting built as a result of the Liberal government, the last Liberal government and the money that we transferred to the province and to the city to build affordable housing. Uh, so I think if we're looking at those areas, uh, we've got a commitment of $700 million to increase the guaranteed income supplement. Mm -hmm. We clearly have to make sure that our seniors have sufficient money to live on. There's no rationale that they should at this point in their life have to decide on whether they're going to fill a prescription or whether they're going to put food on the table for that evening. It's just not acceptable in a country as rich as ours. Absolutely. So championing the issues of, uh, of, of the poor, but I think most importantly is making sure that everybody has an equal opportunity here in Canada. Um, part of our platform as well is uh, the learning passport, but one really important initiative that I want to make sure that I, that I share with you is the uh, issue that we are introducing when it comes to um, if you have a mother or father, if you have a loved one that gets sick, one of the biggest fears that they have, we have, all of us, including you, mm -hmm. even at your young age, is the issue of if you get sick, who's going to take care of you? If you have to go for chemotherapy, if you have to go to a doctor appointments every other day and you're seriously ill, who's going to do that? Mm -hmm. Who's going to take you? Who's going to look after you? Naturally, people want to have their children their daughter or their son, daughter-in-law. They want a close family member. Well, a major initiative in our platform of the family pack, as, as um, Michael calls it, is the, is the ability for your daughter, uh, family member, to be able to take up to six months off from their employment. Hmm. They would receive employment insurance and their job would be protected. So that means that you could have your daughter leave her job without any fear of losing it, and spend up to six months. If it's only three months required, then you take three months mm -hmm. or one month, but up to six months to take you back and forth for your treatments and, and whatever. That's a major move forward in a, in a, in a, from a social perspective in our country, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is extremely important. Another major issue is the commitment to early learning and childcare spaces. I can tell you the amount of doors I knock on that have very able-bodied women that want to get into the workforce and are just waiting for the children to get into, into full-time day school. Well, our commitment to early learning, uh, you're seeing in some of the schools around that uh, have more and more offering full day junior kindergarten at four years old. Mm -hmm. And by having a before and after school program that right away enables a woman to be able to start her own career, mm -hmm. no matter where Absolutely. that is, because her children will be safe. And prior to being four, having more access in communities like ours to uh, daycare spaces that are affordable and safe. So the mother can go and leave her children there and go to work, whether she starts work in a factory or in a retail store, but she starts investing in her future and in, in increasing the economic opportunities for herself and her family. Mm -hmm. That's what people want. I don't believe that people want to stay home and receive a social service check. I believe that almost everybody wants to have a place to go every day. They want to go to work and they want to know that they can climb up that ladder of success. But in order to do that, you have to know your children are safe and being well cared for. And then you can focus on the job mm -hmm. and then you can move yourself forward. Or you go back to school. The Learning Passport uh, program that Michael has announced would allow you the uh, flexibility of collecting up to $1,500 every year for up to four years. That's $4,000 for you to go for retraining um, to, to university or to college. That's a lot of money. And it's, it's there to be an incentive. It's not enough for many of our students who are struggling, mm -hmm. uh, but it's certainly an incentive for many to say, you know what, I am gonna go back to school. Because we have thousands of jobs in this country that we don't have people to fill them. We don't have the skill sets. And people need to go back for retraining $4,000 on a four-year program, $6,000, would seriously, that and OSAP, could seriously change the career of many people here oh, in my constituency. that on OSAP. You know, there's that <laughs> like, OSAP I mean, issue. We're, we're dealing with a lot of yeah. students graduating 
with uh, the highest tuition uh, rate and the highest loan rate. Um, so you're, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's big in terms of history with these uh, students graduating for post-secondary and these huge debts. Yeah. Um, what would you say to those students who are currently strugg struggling but then also will be in a debt for the fear is like decades? Um, that's how hard it is. And then in terms of employment, it's, it's this vicious cycle we're seeing out there is, yeah, there's the jobs out there, but people aren't getting hired and there's precarious work and contract work and and the cycle, it, it's, we're seeing it time and time again and it, speaking to, again, the gap between rich and mm -hmm. poor. How, how are we addressing this? Part of the 4000 or $6,000 a year that would go to each student uh, is not uh, income tested, it's not, uh, you don't have to pay it back. Uh, it's there as a recognition of the struggle of, of trying to uh, keep our students out of excessive debt that they are. Uh, you know, my, I can remember my daughter finishing school at, at York and, um, and having a $30,000 uh, student loan debt. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately rolled that into a mortgage as part of buying a house, so she carried that debt with her for quite a long time. Um, she's very successful today, and if it wasn't for OSAP, that wouldn't happen. How do we get a balance? How do we find more student aid? Uh, there's a lot of tax credits and different ways that we all keep struggling to try to find ways mm -hmm. to help out. And I think we have to continue to look at that. I meet with the Students Federation uh, in Ottawa. They have a great lobby group that comes around uh, a couple times a year. And they make sure that we're fully aware of that. And that is, again, why if you look at the Liberal platform, we are attempting to address the issues of uh, the needs of students. So that whole commitment <coughs> to early learning, because Michael Ignatieff believes that the future is all about education and that and that includes making sure that our kids get access and and that four or six thousand dollars that you would get for a four-year program as a non-repayable non grant is not conditional upon the marks if you have the marks to get into any of the programs on retraining college or university you can you can get that money on an annual basis you apply for it and we're, we're not going to hold you that you have to 80 percent it's not that if you want to go and you want to improve your education and improve your opportunities, we need to invest in, in Canadians, and that's where it starts. Okay. Um, let's go back to some of the stuff we spoke to, or you were speaking to in terms of housing. Um, so housing's been a huge issue. It's a, a social housing in particular, um, a human right. Um, why is it that a country like Canada in the Western world still does not have a housing strategy, a national housing strategy? I, I mean, this has been flagged, um, especially when um, the province and the feds had dumped social housing on municipal governments uh, and still not responding in terms of the need, opening up and getting newcomers in, but still, again, not responding to that, to one of the basic fundamental principles is housing. Um, why is that? And committed federal dollars. So not just a strategy, but federal dollars. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Uh, I find it interesting that you mentioned that. Back in the, 90, in the 80s when housing was getting built, there was a considerable amount that was getting done in the 80s and the 90s, and then it became an issue of money and roles and responsibilities and all these things. And uh, the federal government, I think, was convinced that it wasn't their responsibility to do housing. It was provincial and so on. Um, but in, uh, it was one of the things that I argued about in, my, um, in the uh, urban task force report that I did was the need for housing. Uh, I'm a strong believer that if you don't have a roof over your head, it doesn't matter how many other programs we have. Mm -hmm. if, you don't have a, if you don't have a safe place to sleep, and you don't have a roof over your head, you can't go to the next steps. It's just the reality. So, you know, the, the number one thing that needs to make sure is that we have housing and it is available. And in our 2000 election um, campaign, and in the 2004, as I said earlier, the, I think it was $685 million was transferred down to the provinces, to the cities, mm -hmm. um, as part of our national housing strategy. So we had, as Liberals, reintroduced the national housing strategy. And that whole issue was back to the urban task force report that I did about working in cooperation with the provinces and the city to create housing. Mm -hmm. So the, any that's getting built here in the City of Toronto now is still coming out of that money that 
the Liberals have introduced. Uh, the current government does not believe it's their responsibility to deal with housing. They have nothing to do with it. They don't believe it's their responsibility at all. Uh, and versus us. If you look at our platform, we have committed to a national housing strategy framework that will work with the provinces and the cities again. It doesn't matter how much money we put out in other areas. If you don't have a place to live that is safe and will allow you to be the best that you can be, it's fundamental. It, it, to mm -hmm. me, you, it's just the very basic, very first step has to be housing. And clearly that's part of our platform. And reinvesting in people, both in education and housing, are critical issues for us. Um, in terms of <coughs> policing, um, I'm sure you're hearing on the headlines the stigma attached to the Jane Fitch community. Um, recently, we had the G20, the GHG20, and the impact uh, as middle class, upper class, white communities have been now res or just felt the impacts of what communities like Jane and Finch have been feeling for decades. Um, what are your thoughts on the misspending of that money? as well as uh, thoughts on security and policing and priority of uh, budget lines. Just think of what we could have done with that money. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just think of the billions and billions that, that was wasted. I mean, in particular to the report that came out uh, this week on the G8 spending in Huntsville. You know, $50 million on putting up washrooms that are 100 kilometers away from, uh, from where anyone was going to be. Mm -hmm. the building gazebos, the flagrant misuse of taxpayers' dollars. You know, if you had taken that $50 million and put it in a community like ours, just think of what we could have done. Just think of how much better and how much more beautiful our own community would have been uh, if they had invested the money here. Instead, all we got uh, out of that whole G8, G20 thing was tremendous damage to both the reputation of our city as well as the physical damage, as well as the emotional damage that happened to so many people. And when you asked me about the policing issue and the rest of it, um, I shared the same thought that you had about now you know what it's like to be innocently walking down a street uh, or be observing something and suddenly all of a sudden, you know, you're thought to be doing something that you shouldn't be doing, you know. And, and I very much share the same comment. I thought, now you know what it's like to be in other communities right. that don't... Um, that automatically assume you're doing something that you're not doing and you don't even have a chance to say, I'm just an innocent bystander standing here, but because of your color or because of the location you happen to be, um, you end up being the victim. Uh, I think it showed, unfortunately, some of the real negative issues in and around uh, policing and, and some of the difficulties. I, I think it also showed how easy it is for things to get out of hand mm -hmm. by someone just standing in the wrong place at the wrong time and someone who is in a position of power to uh, feel threatened and also overreact to that particular situation. Uh, Ken has always been very proud of the fact that we allow free voices. You know, this is a democratic country. People come here all, from all around the world to embrace and enjoy democracy. And, and in many forms, we've been losing that democracy. Mm -hmm. And we cannot allow that to happen. If we as Canadians allow a deterioration of the democratic process and our rights and freedoms to be able to freely protest in a peaceful way, uh, then we will be allowing our country to lose a tremendous amount of growth opportunities. Mm -hmm. and, um, we can't allow that peaceful objections to things, making your voices heard. That's what Canada's about. And, and when I travel around the world and I talk to many of my colleagues who do, and they'll go to UN, United Nations meetings and things, and they'll all come back and say, all, all the people I meet around the world are saying, what happened to Canada? Where has it gone? I mean, you know, we, we don't even have it. We should have had a seat on the United Nations panel. This was our turn. We didn't get it as punishment for the fact that we are no longer being viewed as the strong democratic country standing up and fighting for the world that we used to be. And, and that's really sad because we are such a multicultural country. We have a great opportunity to fight on behalf of the inhumanities that are happening around the world, the persecution of Christians, uh, an issue that bothers me immensely. 
around the world where innocent people just want the right to practice their choice of religion mm -hmm. and they're massacred while praying. Uh, it, it, the things that are just not acceptable, the Canada's voice is not being strong enough. And when, you're, when our voices aren't strong, then people who, who create crimes against humanity or persecution of people get away with it because we're not, where are our voices? I mean, it's difficult for a country to advocate outside as well. Or when, you know, you, United Nations did a report on racism mm -hmm. in Canada and that it does exist. What sure, are your yes. thoughts? Does, sure it exists. How does racism look in modern day Canada? Mm. You know, uh, one of the things when I first got elected 22 years ago, uh, Mayor Lastman um, appointed me to the North York Race Relations Committee. I have a colleague, uh, Karen Mock, running in Thornhill, was also part of that who's been fighting on the issue of race relations uh, all her entire life, who is now seeking office uh, uh, to be a member of parliament. Um, you'd like to think that it goes away, but it doesn't go away. Fighting racism is a continued effort by all of us because there, there continues to be, there is lots, there, nobody can say it isn't there. There's lots of racism out there, whether it's against a particular color or a particular country where people come from. There's still lots of it, and it needs to have an active role. You need to keep fighting against it. All of us have fears inside, and, and when people feel threatened, those fears are going to come out, and they express themselves in many, many different ways. And we need to make sure that we are increasing that dialogue, whether it's on racial grounds or religious grounds, so that we have, and I'm very proud in our community, there's a lot of discussion, open discussion, between the issues that are affecting uh, the Sikh community, the black community, whatever community you make about it, whether it's on a, um, been pulled together by our religious leaders, uh, to make sure that we understand each other, that everyone's afraid of terrorism in this country, everyone is around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, and because you may practice a different religion or come from a different country, but you now call Canada home, it doesn't mean that you aren't just as afraid of terrorism. So making sure that we have a dialogue between all of us, I think reduces the fear levels, but does a, a lot to reduce racism. And it's imperative that we keep talking to each other, that we keep working together, because a strong community makes a strong country. And, and that's what you want, that's what your family wants, and that's what my family wants. Um, we touched on employment and post-secondary. In terms of the green wave, this environmental movement that's happening, are there any thoughts uh, around job creation, green job creation, and what that would look like in terms of uh, employment opportunities connecting it to York West community? Well, it's the new way. And, and I have to say that I have met with several companies in the last uh, two or three years that were part of that new initiative, that were, uh, had great plans for solar energy uh, and so on. Um, I met with them when they were first trying to get off the ground and start their own companies, which would mean employment for us, mm -hmm. employment for constituents and residents of York West. Um, but it's the wave of the future. Um, I've also met with them while they were pleading with me to try to find a way to convince the current government to keep going with some programs. Some had been started by the current government, some had been started by the Liberal government, because that is the future. Uh, green energy and, and moving on those issues has to be the way, but it seems like we make so much progress and then all of a sudden it goes backwards. Mm -hmm. um, three of these companies uh, had to close down and lay off. The one in particular had 12 employees, some of them right here from our own uh, constituency, uh, because they no longer had access to the grants. And if you want to get people to uh, change their ways, you often use its grant system. Um, we have in our platform a commitment to up to $13,500. Uh, if you make changes in your homes, uh, whether it's changing the roof or the windows or the doors uh, to reduce your energy costs. Mm -hmm. uh, but all, and all of that is job creation. I met a man putting windows into his house the other day. Now he was doing it out of necessity, but also the fact that, you know, with the high energy costs, he's going to have to, re we have to reduce our energy costs. All we have to do is mm -hmm. go on out and fill up your car. It's now $98 to fill up my car yesterday. Mm -hmm. 
I have the few extra dollars because I'm fortunate to have a wonderful job. What about other people who don't? Mm -hmm. So, you know, reducing our reliance on so many forms of energy is the new way of creating jobs. And that would open the doors for so many in our community to new opportunities. We can't always rely on what we used to do. It's that investment in research and investment that the Liberals have always been very well known for. That uh, I'm hopeful if elected will create a lot of jobs. Because uh, many of the people that I've met in my writing talking about jobs and the green energy are right from here. Mm -hmm. You know, are entrepreneurs. And that's also part of what's made Canada strong is encouraging people to get into their own business. And we've got a lot of smart people here. A lot of smart people in this riding that just need that little step up for them to um, be extremely successful. And when they're successful, you and I are successful mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, so we spoke about austerity measures. Um, we're seeing privatization popping up a lot more. Um, recently, Rob Ford had sold uh, some social housing property uh, by beach by beaches um, and there's fear in terms of what's happening with demantling um, the board as well as just as rhetoric moving forward uh, what are your thoughts around privatization oh, we're also seeing it in the healthcare we're, we're seeing it come up um, how is that going to impact our community and what are we doing or what are you going to do to resist privatization on a local level I think we have to be very careful as we move forward on this talk about privatization. Um, you know, many of the issues we're talking about, uh, if it becomes down to someone making money or not, would have a huge impact on us. Um, I, I am also watching what Mayor Ford's doing because he has, in his own his constituency, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, low income. He has lots of people who are living in uh, community housing. He understands it. Uh, privatizing it, what's that? I mean, you know, just let's be honest about it. How is that going to improve anything? It'll all become about the bottom line for the, for the owner. We've seen that in many places in the riding. Uh, I'm hoping that as, um, you know, you can say all kinds of things in an election campaign, uh, but then once you have the job and you settle into the reality of it, it's not quite so easy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are laws in place about displacing people and having to have an alternative. Uh, I don't see the alternatives being built that would move a person from point A to point B. Uh, I'm watching and listening, uh, but I certainly am hoping that common sense will, will prevail here and that we won't go down that route. I mean, they have privatized uh, social housing in, in some parts of the world. Some of it has been successful, but I think for the most part it isn't. And, and we, as a government, if we had a chance to form government again as a liberal government, are looking at investing in more housing. We're not interested in getting into the private market. We're interested in making sure there are housing for people who need it. And that means that you have to build housing that's affordable for people to get into. Would I like to see more ownership of individual people of their units? Um, if there was a way to do that, I think it's a positive way for people. I think home ownership, if it's this little tiny box, whatever it is, builds pride and pride is important for people and if there's a way of creating that that's affordable for people to give them something that they own that's theirs i'm dealing today with people who are scared about losing their houses you know that that have owned them for 20 years but can't afford them anymore they can't afford to carry them what are they going to do uh, everything's become too expensive so housing's a huge issue and i think again i go back it's a fundamental importance. If you don't have a roof over your head, you can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that we're housing the people of this country and that we're working with people to achieve those goals. You, you asked me about, us, about other austerity measures and you know if you keep talking about punishing people for being poor and punishing people because they're sick, you know it, it's not the Canadian way. It's not, it's not the Canada that you and I are proud of. You know, we still have far too much poverty in this country, but that's where education comes. And, and I have become, in the 22 years of politics, to truly believe that education is the key to so many things. You know, let's get our, let's get our citizens educated from as early as we can get them into daycare programs where they get challenged. 
and motivated to be the best that they can be. But that means you remove barriers. And that's employment barriers that needed, those doors need to be removed. And that goes back to a few of the issues we talked about, mm -hmm. whether it's racism or, or people's own discrepancies that they have. You know, a person walks through the door that's non-white and they already have an opinion. We've got to mm -hmm. remove those opinions and make them positive because we're all Canadians. This country, the future is all about immigration here in this country. And we better embrace it. Uh, as a former minister of citizenship immigration, I uh, love the fact that our country is so diverse and, uh, and, and has such a diversity of language. Uh, um, come into my constituency, uh, my campaign office, and any given day you can have all kinds of different foods and uh, a mixture of people, all the same dream. Mm -hmm. They want to be successful. They want to have a roof over their head. They don't want to have to worry every night, how am I going to pay the bills at the end of the month? And I think as elected officials, our job is to make sure that public policy is reflecting those needs. But more than reflecting them, it's meeting them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of work happening within shelters, women's shelters, um, uh, shelter sanctuaries, um, to keep law enforcement and immigration officers out of these spaces. Um, so these women and children have some form of protection. Um, <clears throat> so there was a lot of community resistance and, and uh, policy was made and then recently there was a small change that allows immigration and law enforcement to get into uh, shelters. Um, it, we talk about poverty and we talk about racism, <clears throat> but I feel, you know, children and women are the most oppressed uh, in Toronto and really take on this burden and are open target and the most vulnerable. Um, what are your thoughts to, to this experience or reality? I talked to somebody who was the former minister of Citizenship and Immigration and uh, was one of the most difficult times uh, in my life, one of the most challenging times, one of the most fulfilling times. Mm. I'm often asked about what it was like and I often say the one regret that I have is that I didn't have enough time to do more, to make more changes in the policies that protect people, in particular families that are being torn apart, having the mothers and fathers sent home and having to leave the children here. I mean, things that are not the Canadian way, but forget the Canadian one, things that aren't right. Things that aren't right under, the, under human rights or any other rights of, in, the, in a so-called civilized world that we live in. And women and children tend to be the one to pay the biggest price. Um, I have immense opposition to the fact that uh, immigration officials or police officials can go into a shelter. The word shelter is supposed to mean a safe place. Mm -hmm. And the idea that they could go in there and, and uh, it's something that I have real real problem with. I don't think it should be happening. Um, women bear an unfair burden in so many ways in our society and um, are, are left to struggle. And uh, the deportations in our country is increased immensely. Um, many you don't hear about. Many people are just giving up. They're not waiting for the deportation order to come they just go home. And they go home to unsafe conditions. The reason they came here is they were looking for a better life. Mm -hmm. And their disappointment on how they were treated is quite unacceptable. Do people need to respect the rules? Of course they do. We have an immigration system that I believe needs an extensive overhaul. I have said that from the time I was the minister. But all those things take time to do. And I would hope in the future, if we have the opportunity to form government, that we can make the changes necessary in our immigration system that are going to be there to help people come here. Canada is going to rely completely on immigration for future growth. So it's time everyone in this country of ours realized how important immigration is and stop using it as something to kick around, abuse and blame 
for every problem that isn't successful in this country, they blamed the immigration issues, the immigration. Well, I think it's time they woke up and realized how important immigration is. And we better find a way of getting a better handle on it. The current government is allowing under the te temporary grant, temporary um, work process to, uh, to allow people to come here mm -hmm. and work for two or three years and then go back home. If you can come into a country Mm -hmm. and, and meet a skill. You're coming here because we have a particular skill that you... Let me tell you about a winemaker uh, that was working for a, a company that makes wine. It's a big issue, a big deal in Canada now. We have a lot of people who like wine. <laughs> um, they couldn't find one. They advertised and they brought in a temporary foreign worker. The gentleman was here for three years and then had to go back home even though the, we still had employment here. You still couldn't find anybody here but he still had to go back home. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to go through that process of hiring again. That, that's nothing other than just exploiting people. If they're able to come here to have a steady job, not to have criminal activity, to contribute to building our country, I think they've earned their spot. I think they've earned the opportunity to apply to stay in Canada and to help us build the country. By that time, they have a language settled. Some have already, you know, bought a house. Well, sorry, you have to leave now. I mean, that's, it's nothing mm -hmm. in my mind short of exploitation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, lots of opportunity for improvements uh, to make sure that our country is growing in the positive way that it needs. And making the country stronger on behalf of many of the people, the skills that you bring mm -hmm. to the country when you come in through immigration. Uh, you know, encouraging entrepreneurship. All of the things that help people be the best they can be, in particular women. You know, a lot of the small businesses are started up by women. And, you know, we need to encourage more and more of that. Women make great entrepreneurs. And, uh, you know, people come, whether they're artists, um, they, can, uh, they can make some beautiful things. And so make the country stronger by opening the doors to opportunity. That's what needs to be done. Okay. A couple more questions. Um, so one of the questions we got was, um, you don't care about us. You only care about the Italian European community. What would you say to uh, people who share uh, that opinion? Mm -hmm. I think they should get to know me. Um, go knock on the doors of 15 Tobamori. Knock on the doors of, of the people who live there. Um, I say that I was just I've been there recently and I was so elated at the response at the door. They all know me, they all know my office. Uh, and you did this for me, you did that for me, you did something else for me. You know, uh, people can form whatever opinion they want to form. Uh, anybody who's come to my office know I care about them. I don't care where you come from, I don't care what the color of your skin is, I don't care whether you vote or not. You all get, treat, you all get treated the same. I think I try to make sure that you get treated with love, respect and courtesy. Uh, you are a resident of this great city of ours and I want you to be the best that you can be. And if I can help you in any way, I'm going to do it. Because uh, I'm being selfish, because at the end of the day, it makes me feel good. It gives me a feeling of satisfaction that I made a difference, whatever slight difference it was. Was I just there to hold your hand because you were going through a terrible time? Was I there to cry with you? Was I there to help you? That's what matters to me. I don't really care what nationality you are. It doesn't matter. I go to lots of my different churches and I um, pray together and we sing together and we will eat together. So those who have outdated uh, opinions uh, probably haven't had anything to do with me or my office. Okay. Uh, so the last question, <clears throat> if you can look into the camera, uh, and uh, Actually, a message. Pay any attention to that camera whatsoever. <laughs> so I don't know if I've insulted you or not, but. <laughs> so you can look into the camera and any words to your constituency or thoughts to take with them on voting day? Please get out and vote. I believe that this is one of the most important elections for each and every one of us in this country. We have a platform that talks all about you talks about your family, it talks about the things that you need that I think my family needs just like yours. We need to make sure that on May 2nd that we elect a liberal government in this country. 
a compassionate, caring government that puts people's first, families first. I have always, in my 22 years in politics, put people first, ahead of everything else. I will continue to do that. I have been honored to have been your elected representative uh, at the federal level for almost 12 years. And uh, with your support, I will continue to do the very best job that I can. I will continue to fight to ensure that your voice is heard in Ottawa and other, way, other places across this great country. Thank you for the honor of representing you for such a long period of time. And uh, please make sure you get out and vote on May 2nd. It's your choice. Please make the liberal choice.